I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker today, Leonardo De Chirico. Leonardo is a pastor of a church that he helped plant in Rome back in 2009. He is also the vice chairman of the Italian Evangelical Alliance. He has published multiple books, including the Christian's Pocket Guide to the Papacy. Um, he is also a lecturer on historical theology and is the director of the Reformanda Initiative, which aims to equip evangelical leaders to understand and better engage with Roman Catholicism. And finally, he is also the leader of the Roman Scholars and Leaders Network. Let us welcome Leonardo. Welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Amy, Jamie. And uh, I'm very glad to be uh, with you uh, today. And uh, I thank you for participating at this uh, uh, master class on Roman Catholicism. As you probably notice, just uh, next to me, I have a statue of Martin Luther. Why? Uh, the reason is that um, on the 17th of April, 500 years ago, 1521, Martin Luther stood uh, in front of the Diet of Worms and uh, he was challenged and asked to recant his uh, uh, rediscovery of the biblical gospel. And uh, before uh, the Diet of Worms, uh, Martin Luther uh, famously responded uh, those, uh, in, this, in this way. Here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. And as we approach the topic of Catholicism, it is important that we remind the fact that we stand on the shoulders of believers, sisters and brothers of past generations who have uh, helped us to uh, defend the, go the biblical gospel, to proclaim it in our world, and to try to equip ourselves to be better servants of the cause of the gospel. So, what we're going to do today is uh, to have uh, uh, five sessions. Uh, you, you see them on your screen, and the first one will be entitled Same Words, Same Gospel. The second one will be entitled Roman and Catholic, Why Roman and Why Catholicism? The third one will be entitled Where is the Roman Catholic Church going with Pope Francis? And uh, the fourth one will be Can Evangelicals be United with Rome? And the last one will be entitled communicating the gospel to Roman Catholics. We're going to have a short break after session three. So if you wait for that break, you'll be able to then rest a little bit. But uh, for the time being, I hope that you will follow through all the uh, first three and then the second two uh, sessions of our masterclass, you might ask yourself, why is it important that we as evangelicals um, reflect on the reality and the developments and the challenges of Roman Catholicism? And uh, I have four very brief reasons on why we should do that and why it is right that you are participating at this forum uh, masterclass. First of all, it is a global issue. It is everywhere you go in the world, you will find the Roman Catholic Church from north to south, from east to west. The Roman Catholic Church will be there. And if you want to have a grasp of what the religious landscape of our world is all about, you need to encounter 
uh, the Catholic Church, and you need to be equipped on how to do that faithfully. Secondly, it's a theological issue. 500 years ago, the Protestant Reformation fought in order to recover the biblical gospel. And that uh, uh, spiritual fight is still with us. And if we want to understand not only the history, but the core of the issues that were at stake then and are still at stake now, you should deal with uh, what Roman Catholicism claims to be. Thirdly, it's an evangelistic issue. Many of us do know people who claim to be Catholics and yet have perhaps no personal living uh, relationship with the Lord. And so we want to be good witnesses to them. And so this is important that we grasp what Roman Catholicism teaches and how we can best approach our friends and family members with the gospel. And finally, it's also a testing issue in the sense that uh, in the last uh, decades, evangelicals worldwide have become more hesitant, if not confused, in how to approach Roman Catholicism. They have become more confused in assessing and uh, realizing what is at stake with the Catholic Church with regards to the gospel. And so it is important that we approach the topic not being overwhelmed by the growing ecumenical embracement that wants us to be on the same page with all Christians around the world, no matter the theological issues, no matter the standing important fundamental points of difference. It is important to exercise spiritual discernment. And so the first then uh, session is entitled Same Words, Same Gospel. And I want to begin with a quotation from a very important book that came out uh, 15 years ago in the US, written by famous historian Mark Knoll. And in that book, Is the Reformation Over? That's the title of the book. In that book, Mark Knoll uh, um, reads the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which had been published in 1992, the latest edition. And in reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Knoll argues that evangelicals can embrace two-thirds of the catechism of the Catholic Church. There are commonalities, large commonalities, sharing of words, sharing of concepts, sharing of ideas, to the point that two-thirds of the catechism, which contains the uh, teaching of the Catholic Church, can be acceptable. So on the one hand, there are great and large similarities that are apparent at the level of common language. But then Knowles, Noel goes on by saying at the same time that if you dig in deep, deeper, wherever you find the word Christ, you find the activity, the reality of the church that is the Roman Catholic Church. The Catechism speaks of Christ, but it interweaves him with the church to the point of making them one. So the word is Christ, but the meaning is the Roman Catholic Church. The authority of Christ is the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. The grace of Christ is the grace administered through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. The truth of Christ is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The word is Christ, but the meaning is not the biblical Christ. It's something that is beyond the biblical Christ. 
So you see the, the point here. In, with regards to Roman Catholicism, we do share a lot of common words. But if we do our homework in order to assess the meaning of these words, we easily and quickly come to the point that beyond sharing the same sounds, the same phonetics, the same words as they are pronounced, the meaning is very different. The meaning is very different. And we could ask why? Why is it so? We will make a few examples in a moment. But I want, to, I want you to appreciate the, fact, the reason why we do have similar words and yet we have different gospels, different meanings attached to the words. In the Roman Catholic understanding, the revelation of God comes to us in two ways. On the one hand, there is the written records of sacred scripture. On the other, the words of scripture are part of a wider oral ongoing revelation that has to do with tradition. Tradition precedes the Bible and exceeds the Bible, is bigger than the Bible. The Bible is, in Catholic teaching, only one part of divine revelation, which is preceded and followed by the oral tradition. Ultimately, scripture and tradition can be found in the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the magisterium, which is the official teaching of the church, where the uh, teaching of scripture is interpreted in the context of the tradition that precedes and exceeds scripture and ultimately understood in the way in which the church understands it. So that the end result of this complex process is what you find at the bottom of the slide. You have parts of scripture there but intertwined, preceded, and followed by other teachings or other interpretations or nuances or elements to the point that the teaching of Scripture becomes so hidden that it is no longer discernible. It is biblically not understandable anymore because it is part of a bigger whole that is not driven by Scripture, but is driven by Scripture and tradition as they are interpreted by the official teaching of the Church. That's the heart of the problem. When using the same words, the Roman Catholic Church understands them in the way in which the church itself has determined their meanings. Few examples. The words, we could make many more examples. Every single word, although shared in sounds, is different in meaning. And we have to go beyond commonalities in the way in which we pronounce words. You remember Noel saying, on the one hand, two-thirds seem agreeable. But then, if you dig deeper, whenever you find Christ, it is not the biblical Christ that you find, it is the Christ of the Roman Catholic Church that you find in those words of the Catechism. Conversion. In standard biblical evangelical understanding, conversion is that life experience that turns our lives away from our 
sins and redirects them towards God in forgiveness, repentance, and faith. It is a life-changing experience. It's a U-turn experience that brings us from being alienated from God, separated from God, far away from God, dead in our sins, from that to the new life in Christ. It's a U-turn experience that happens once in our life. And it, it is associated with the gift of justification and the miracle of regeneration. It is something that happens once in life. But in Catholic understanding, conversion is something that happens every day. It must happen every day, constantly. Is, conversion is an ongoing journey. Every day we must convert. And so we use the same word, and present-day Catholicism uses the word conversion very, very much, but it means something different. It speaks about going on in the sacramental journey administered by the church through doing good works. So the word is the same, but the meaning is different. If we talk about conversion, we're not talking about the same thing. We are using the same word, but not meaning the same thing. Take, for instance, justification, a key basic word of the biblical gospel recovered at the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. And Luther uh, was there at Worms saying, I can do no other. Here I stand in the gospel of justification by faith. And justification, biblically speaking, means being declared by God himself, righteous, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and being imputed the righteousness of Christ to us sinners. In Roman Catholic understanding, justification has a very different meaning. The meaning is that we are given, infused, the righteousness of God, and we have to work with it in order to increase it, hoping that at the end of our lives, the degree and amount of justice that we have contributed to receive will be enough for us to be admitted to purgatory and to paradise. You see, justification is, in the Catholic understanding, is a process that involves an initial sacrament being given at baptism and ongoing sacraments being received by the church that opens up the treasury of divine grace to us in order to increase in the journey of justification. So it is an open-ended process. It is not a declaration, a forensic legal declaration that comes to us in Christ alone by way of its merits and achieved at the cross and the resurrection of Christ, by which we stand assured that on judgment day, we will be saved, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done for us. In the Catholic understanding, justification is an ongoing process that involves the sacraments of the church, your good works, your merits, and eventually, hopefully, they will be enough for you to be admitted to purgatory or to paradise. You see, same words, but they are very different meanings. Think about mercy. And this is going to be our last uh, uh, example. Mercy is a wonderful word, word 
that comes to us uh, in the Bible, in the gospel, and especially in it, it is the goodness of God, the benevolence of God that comes to us uh, as it is exemplified and also uh, brought about in the person and work of Jesus Christ that has dealt with our sins, uh, bearing our own sins on our behalf and uh, uh, paying for our sins and uh, being subjected to the Father's judgment on our behalf, especially as it is used in present-day Roman Catholicism by the present reigning Pope, Pope Francis. Mercy, in the Catholic understanding, is this all-embracing kind of acceptance of all beliefs, all lifestyles, all journeys of life, whereby everyone is accepted, everyone is forgiven, and ultimately everyone is saved. And so, in a sense, uh, what is lost is the uh, dreadful condition of, our, of us as sinners and the precious work of the Lord Jesus in having handled our own uh, situation with his work at the cross and at the resurrection. Mercy is something that uh, eschews all the atonement and the righteousness of God and the execution of his judgment on the Lord Jesus. Mercy is a universalistic concept in the Catholic understanding. So we use the same words, but we have a different meaning. We could go on and on in talking about sin. According to the Catholic Church, sin is a wound, is a weakness, is not the tragic broken relationship with God as sinners that needs a miracle from and by God himself in order to be restored. It is something of an inner weakness that makes us still in some way capable of dealing with God. And grace, according to this Catholic understanding, uh, builds on top of our own capabilities, which are still there because the Catholic understanding of sin is not as tragic as the Bible portrays it is. So, same words, different worlds. And this is why we should be aware of moving beyond common, uh, superficial commonalities in language and doing our homework in order to understand from within the meaning that the Roman Catholic Church gives to the words that the church uses. And in doing so, realizing that in spite of the common sounds, the meanings that are attached are very different. Thank you for um, following this first session. Now we move on in a time of Q&A, and I ask Jamie to take over from now on. Great, thank you. So we'll get started with our first question. Our first question is, is the fall of man not a Catholic doctrine. No, there is, there is a sense in which the Catholic Church has a doctrine of the fall of man. The problem lies in the interpretation of that doctrine. Again, we, we find the doctrine in the Catechism, but according to standard Catholic teaching, the interpretation of that fall is not as tragic and universal as bringing about the total corruption of us human beings as the Bible teaches that is the case. We are still 
There is still a residual goodness in us, according to the Catholic Church. There is still something that we can do in order to cooperate with the grace of God. There is something that, is, that uh, makes us, this is the technical word, capax dei, capable of God, capable of relating with God. So grace comes as an helper, not as a life-changing miracle. It is something that is added on top of our nature and not a life that brings about life where there is death. Thank you for that. Our next question, if all are forgiven and saved, has the Catholic Church given up on being the one true holy and apostolic faith? Good question, thank you. This is the fact that the Catholic Church is the true and only church is only one definition of the Catholic Church. The other important definition that we have to bear in mind is the claim that the Catholic Church is the sacrament of unity between God and humankind. In a sense, the church is the sign and instrument, the sacrament of unity between God and humankind, the sign and instrument of the unity of mankind before God. And the goal of the Catholic Church is to be the, uh, the religious institution that brings about, carries through the whole of humanity into salvation. So in post-Vatican II Roman Catholic theology, the borders of the church have been stretched to the point of being overlapped with the borders of humanity. We will be looking at this in a moment in the third session. I will be I will give more details uh, in the third session about that. Thank you. We have so many questions coming in. Um, our next question is, is eternal security a biblical teaching? Yes, it is, because it is grounded on the perfect work of Christ. It is, doesn't depend on us. It is something of a, a gift that comes from God in Christ alone. And if we are Christ's, we can be assured that uh, we will be saved, not because of anything we do, but because Christ has already and perfectly accomplished. Thank you. Our next question, is, is it the differences of translations of Bibles that make it the conversations difficult with Catholic brothers and sisters? And if so, are there key strategies for getting on the same page? Nor, generally speaking, the translations are not a big issue in uh, getting into meaningful dialogue with Catholics. Of course, there are various translations, but uh, not to the point of being an obstacle to um, our conversation. It is true that the Catholic Bibles contain the apocryphal books of the Old Testament. They contain a section of books that is not part of the Hebrew Bible, but that the Council of Trent in the 16th century added to the Old Testament canon. But as far as translations go, uh, it is not a main issue uh, in our, it, the problem is not, does not have to do with translations, it has to do with interpretation. Great. Next we have um, from somebody who works with young people, when sharing the gospel or communicating with Catholics, 
should we avoid these words and just try to define the words as they go along? Very good question. I will address this point exactly at the, at the, at the end of our uh, masterclass in the fifth uh, session, but this is exactly the point. We have to allow the Bible to define the terms, not assuming that we have uh, we, we, we share the same meanings, giving, assuming it, but actually proving from the Bible that we follow the intentions and the meanings given by the Bible itself, allowing Scripture to speak for itself. Perfect. Um, next, we have, how do Roman Catholics understand original sin? They do, of course, have a, a doctrine of original sin. But again, um, and you can look at it in the catechism or other magisterial uh, texts, such as the Council of Trent, which has a section explicitly uh, dedicated to original sin, which was one of the issues at the Reformation. In the Catholic Church, there are several strands or traditions uh, that are used to interpret um, not only original sin, but uh, original sin as part of those issues. There is the Augustinian interpretation, there is the Thomist interpretation, there is a Franciscan interpretation, there are modern interpretations. And so, uh, what I can say in a nutshell is that uh, taking all these interpretations together, the end result is that the overall picture is not of a radical, tragic fall, but it is more of a wound, more of a weakness entering the world. Uh, of course, bringing about uh, a flaw in nature and creation, but not to the point of bringing about spiritual death. Great, thank you. All right, we have time for one last question. Is the difference in the understanding of mercy what makes Catholicism believe in sainthood like they do? Uh, I don't think so. They, the sainthood is part of the Catholic understanding of the mediation of grace. Uh, the, the, the thought whereby the mediation, media, mediatorship of Christ, the fact that Christ is the mediator, allows for sub-mediators to be part of that mediation. And the saints are the heroes, those who have shown a high degree of commitment that have merited the position of sharing in the mediatorship of Christ. And this is not a biblical teaching uh, because Christ's mediation is sufficient and in and of itself uh, final for all of us. Of course, we admire the saints of, uh, of the past, and we are all saints in the sense that we are given the holiness of God, and, uh, but we don't share the view whereby the saints participate or partake in the mediatorship of Christ.